What would it feel like if you could ride a beam of light? Your watch would never tick. Your heartbeat would never start. From your point of view, the entire journey would be over the instant it began. That sentence sounds dramatic, but it's the quiet consequence of how space-time works. Tonight, we're going to see why time stops at the speed of light, why nothing with mass can ever get there, and how the universe enforces this rule with math, experiments, and a few mind-bending thought pictures you won't forget. Start with a simple clock, two mirrors facing each other, and a single photon bouncing between them. Tick at the bottom, tock at the top. If the clock is sitting still next to you, the photon goes straight up and down. Now imagine the same clock whizzing sideways past you. To you, the photon has to take a diagonal path to keep up with the moving mirrors, tracing out a longer zigzag between tick and tock. Longer path at the same light speed means a longer time between ticks. That's time dilation in one line. Moving clocks tick slower compared with clocks at rest. There's a compact equation that captures that story. The factor is gamma. One divided by the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. At everyday speeds, V is small and gamma is basically 1, so you never notice. Push V closer to C and gamma swells. At 90% of light speed, gamma is about 2.3. A moving clock loses more than half its ticks compared to yours. At 99.9%, .9 gamma is roughly 22. At 99 99999% it's thousands as v approaches c gamma aims at infinity that's the mathematical way of saying from your perspective the moving clock's time stretches thinner and thinner but thin time measured by whom relativity is careful about frames what counts as moving or at rest depends on who's doing the measuring. There's one time that doesn't care about that choice. Proper time. Proper time is the time read by a clock that rides along with the object, the time written on its wristwatch. Special relativity tells us how proper time accumulates along a path through space-time. The little element of proper time, d tau, equals the little element of coordinate time, dt, times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Multiply those tiny pieces along the journey and you get the traveler's total time. If v is less than c, that square root is a real number less than 1 and the traveler ages. If v equals c exactly, the square root becomes 0. Proper time stops adding up. Light does not experience time between emission and detection. There isn't a light's point of view you can sit inside. Light doesn't carry a rest frame at all. There's a second way to see this that looks like geometry. In special relativity, time and space form a four-dimensional stage. Between any two events, you can compute an invariant called the space-time interval. For time-like separations, paths that any massive traveler could follow, the interval is positive and it measures the proper time along that best possible path. For space-like separations, points too far apart in space to influence each other quickly enough, the interval is negative and no signal connects them without breaking the rules. Light sits right on the boundary where the interval is zero. Physicists call that a null world line. Null path means zero proper time. It's a geometric statement baked into the Pythagorean-like structure of space-time, not a dramatic claim about consciousness or perception. Light moves on the edge where the clock never advances. If that sounds abstract, 
pin it down with things we can measure. High energy particles called muons are born in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays smash into air molecules. Muons live for a tiny fraction of a microsecond before decaying. At rest, most would never make it to sea level. They'd vanish long before. And yet, detectors at the ground pick up floods of them. How? In our frame, the muons are moving near the speed of light, so their internal clocks run slow. Their lifetimes stretch, and thousands survive the trip. Flip the perspective to the muon's proper time, and you get an equally true story. The muon's clock ticks normally, but the atmosphere is Lorentz contracted, squashed thinner in its direction of travel, so the ground arrives before the muon's built-in stopwatch runs out. Same math, two consistent views, one reality. Time for the traveler and time for the observer are related by that gamma factor. Your phone proves this isn't just for cosmic rays. GPS satellites carry atomic clocks. Because they orbit fast and sit higher in a weaker gravitational field, their time slips relative to clocks on Earth, slower from motion, faster from gravity. Engineers pre-bias the satellite clocks and apply continuous corrections so your map pins don't drift kilometers each day. No corrections, no navigation. Relativity pays your rent by keeping time. If light never experiences time, why can't we just push a rocket harder and harder until our proper time slows to a crawl and then to a stop? Because the universe says, sure, slow to a crawl, and Nope, never to a stop. Not for anything with mass. There are three intertwined reasons. First, that gamma factor soaring toward infinity tells you the energy required to keep adding speed grows without bound. Kinetic energy is gamma minus one times mc squared. As v approaches c, gamma explodes. The last little nudges towards C would demand infinite energy. Second, length contraction and momentum pile on. As you push harder, your momentum rises faster than your speed because gamma multiplies it. You feel that as stubbornness against further acceleration. Third, the velocity addition rule in relativity forbids you from stacking speeds past all. Even if a ship moving at 0.9 c fires a probe at 0.9 c relative to itself, an outside observer doesn't see 1.88 c. The formula folds them together and yields a new speed still below c. No sequence of legal pushes gets you across the limit. So when we say time stops at the speed of light, we're not promising a spaceship trick. We're reading the structure of space-time out loud. Massless things like photons and, as far as we can tell, gravitational waves travel on null paths with zero proper time. Massive things always travel on time-like paths with positive proper time. You can make your proper time between two events as small as you like by approaching C, but you can't make at exactly zero. That's the border between what can have a rest frame and what cannot. There's a temptation to imagine what the world looks like to a photon. It's a useful impulse. Build intuition, push limits, but here the limits matter. Without a rest frame, you can't assign the photon its own coordinates without tearing the math. Distances along the direction of motion would contract to zero clocks would stop, and simultaneity, what counts as now, would degenerate. The clean thing to keep is the invariant. Along a light-like path, proper time doesn't accumulate. You don't need to build an impossible camera inside a photon's eyes to accept that statement. Speaking of simultaneity, 
That's the other piece that makes time stops feel weird. In everyday life, we think of a single global now slicing through the world. Relativity replaces that with a menu. Simultaneity depends on motion. Two events that are at the same time for you are at different times for someone gliding by. You can see this in a thought experiment with a long train and two lightning strikes. To a person on the embankment, the strikes at the front and back are simultaneous. To a person riding the train, the strike at the front is hit first or last, depending on the train's direction. No paradox, just a different angle through space-time. When you push to near light speeds, those differences explode. What's a tiny skew at car speeds becomes a headline at 0.99c. That's part of why time slows is only one face of the diamond. Slices of now tilt is another face you need to hold at the same time. There is a beautiful symmetry hidden here. The speed of light isn't light's property so much as space-time's conversion rate between space and time. Light gets the honor because it has no mass. Any massless influence must move at that invariant speed. If tomorrow we found a new massless particle, it would sprint at C too. If you removed all light from the universe, C would still be the conversion between meters and seconds in the geometry of the stage. That's why gravitational waves, ripples in space-time itself, travel at C as well. The number is deeper than the thing that first introduced us to it. Let's get a feel for approaching the stop. Imagine you cruise past Earth at 99.99% of C on a long outbound leg. For you, the ship's clocks are normal. You sip coffee, read, sleep. For people on Earth, your clock ticks about 70 times slower. A year for you is decades for them. Turn around and come home, and you'll step out younger than your twin by an amount you both can agree on when you reunite. That's the twin paradox with the confusion shaved off. The twin who turned around felt acceleration and changed frames. Proper time along your path was simply shorter. No contradiction. It's geometry again. Different world lines between the same two reunion events yield different accumulated proper times, and the longest time between meetings belongs to the person who took the gentlest, straightest, time-like route, stayed home. Push to the limit in a different way. Consider a laser beam leaving a distant galaxy and arriving at your telescope after a billion years by our clocks. Along that beam's world line, the proper time from emission to detection is zero. That's not poetry, it's the invariant interval's verdict. For the photon, there is no on the way. For us, the universe aged, stars were born and died, continents shifted, and the beam met your mirror. Two consistent stories, one math. Does anything ever go faster than light? Signals do not, but appearances can. Sweep a laser spot across the moon and the bright dot can race faster than sea. No information rides the spot sideways. A burst of plasma in a distant jet can look superluminal because of geometry and light travel time. The blob itself stays under sea. You'll even hear about phase velocity faster than C in some media or group velocities doing strange tricks in dispersive materials. Those are patterns and envelopes, not new couriers. The universe has one speed limit that matters for cause and effect. Everything else is a silhouette on the wall. There's another everyday place where near C shows up. Particle accelerators. Electrons in a synchrotron get an energy boost lap after lap. Their speed barely changes. They were already within a hair of C. What grows is gamma. Their energy and momentum soar while their velocity remains asymptotically shy of the limit. 
That's why synchrotrons need giant magnets and why their particles spray blue Cherenkov light when they slam into water. Inside the water, light is slower than C, so the electrons can outpace the local light and leave a photonic, sonic boom. Even there, the rule stays intact. Nothing outruns C in vacuum. Let's press on the most common confusion. If time stops at C, does time almost stop just below C? It can, relative to someone else. But almost stop depends on the comparison. Your proper time never feels strange to you. What changes is how your proper time maps onto someone else's coordinates. That mapping is the entire game. You can arrange to live one week while a century passes on a distant planet by flying near sea, coasting and turning around. You did not freeze your heart or your thoughts. You took a path where less proper time accumulates between departure and return. Why should any of this be true? You can derive it from two principles that have passed every experimental test. The laws of physics are the same in every inertial frame and there is an invariant speed, the speed of light in vacuum, measured to be the same by all observers, no matter how they move. Those two together force space and time to mix when you change frames. They force lengths to contract in the direction of motion and time to dilate. They force simultaneity to become relative and they force C to be unreachable by anything that has rest mass and always exactly reached by anything that does not. We didn't choose a dramatic story and then tailor the math. The math was cornered by two humble, symmetric demands. If there's one mental picture to carry away, make it this. Each world line through space-time is a kind of road with a built-in odometer the proper time. Massless roads lie along the light cones with their odometers stuck at zero. Massive roads must stay inside those cones and their odometers count positive time. You can take crooked roads and age less or straighter roads and age more but you can't jump onto the light-like edge. The geometry won't let your wheels fit on that lane. Tie it back to the opening question, riding a beam of light. That fantasy falls apart not because the universe lacks imagination, but because the concept resting with light doesn't exist inside the rules. Time stops at sea is our shorthand for proper time along a light-like path is zero. It explains why photons don't decay on the way from distant galaxies why causality has a speed, why GPS needs relativity, why muons reach your detector, why particle accelerators are machines of gamma, not of V. It's the same small set of ideas seen from different seats in the theater. So the next time you hear someone say, nothing can go faster than light, you can answer with more precision. Nothing can outrun the invariant speed that stitches space to time, and nothing with mass can even equal it. At that speed, clocks don't tick. Not because magic happens, but because the path itself leaves no room for ticks to stack. The universe enforces that with geometry, energy, and every experiment we've been clever enough to build. And that, quietly, is why time stops at the speed of light.